So let me begin by discussing what happened, you know, to our um, socioeconomic variables uh, for the years 2020 until 2022. Uh, many of this uh, you already uh, very well know. So um, what I have here is uh, the GDP growth uh, per quarter, year on year. Uh, uh, apologies, I, I <laughs> the year actually does not show. But anyway, so what we have here is that uh, what you can see here is that we suffered a very deep contraction um, during the second quarter of, uh, of 2020. That was a minus 16.9, if you can see my cursor. And then now we have uh, started uh, showing um, still negative uh, growths, uh, quarters, uh, several quarters after that. And then we, uh, we begin to see a positive growth rate actually during the second quarter of uh, 2021. And then for this first semester of 2022, then uh, the economy grew 7.8%. And uh, we are actually very... Um, very happy with this uh with this uh with this performance given that there was actually an uptick in cases in uh, covid-19 in january of 2022 and uh oh, so we see that uh um despite that uptick in cases uh, first quarter performance was at, as was at 8.2% uh, growth rate and then for the second quarter uh the economy grew by 7.4% then we also noted that uh, growth was uh, broad-based, but some sectors remain uh, below the pre-pandemic levels. So um, we see that, uh, uh, for instance, um, consumer spending was actually already um, higher than uh, its pre-pandemic level. So this one is indexed to its uh, pre-pandemic level. Um, but we saw that uh, during the um, during second quarter of uh, of 2020, there there was actually a, a decline in this uh, uh, in the household uh, final consumption expenditure, and we think that this is uh, driven by the uh, higher global oil prices and uh, of course constraints on uh, the domestic supply of some food items. Uh, as you can see, uh, exports is also taking uh, much longer to um, to recover. And then, if you look at the uh, the production sectors, then we we see here that um, we still have uh, some sectors that remain below their pre pandemic levels. So we're looking at um, uh, transport, accommodation, other services, mining, real estate, uh, and even uh, manufacturing, although just slightly below uh, the pre-pandemic levels. Now, if you look at uh, our real per capita GDP, which is actually the uh, the, the better measure of uh, of well-being, uh, uh, instead of uh, just the uh, the entire real GDP. So we saw that, uh, for instance, in the in second quarter of, uh, of 2020, that was really a very sharp decline to an 81.9% um, versus uh, a pre-pandemic level, let's say at 2019 equals 100. And uh, it already went up actually during the first quarter of this year uh, to almost uh, the same level as in 2019. But then we see that uh, there was a slight decline uh, in uh, during the, the second quarter. Again, this is uh, being driven by uh, by inflation. In terms of uh, unemployment, we are actually uh, would like to report that the unemployment rate improved to uh, to six percent in June of 2022, uh, and this is uh, a decline from the 7.7 percent during the same uh, period of uh, uh, last year versus uh, June 2021. In terms of net employment generation, this actually. Uh, uh, is uh, 1.5 million uh, more workers employed between June 2021 and June of 2022. But versus the January of 2020, uh, this is actually, uh, uh, sorry, the January 2020 versus the January 22, 2022, that's uh, an additional 475,000. Now, this uh, contraction in the, in the economy is, uh, of course, um, 
this is responsible really for the, the for the decline in in poverty as also as already reported earlier that between uh, um 2015 and 2018 actually poverty declined significantly and we're looking at uh, a decline of uh by 6.8 percentage points but between 20 18 and 2021, uh, we saw that there was uh, an increase in poverty incidence, and this is income poverty incidence from 16.7% uh, to an 18.1 or 1.4 percentage points. Uh, this translates to 2.3 million more poor Filipinos in 2021 relative to um, 2018. Now, this economic uh, contraction and and of course the uh, the, the poverty uh, the increase in income poverty incidence is uh, largely due to the very stringent non pharmaceutical intervention measures that were implemented and this is actually just a comparative uh, chart taken from an adb study uh, which shows that uh, in the case of the philippines we actually uh, implemented very uh, strict measures to address the uh, to arrest the um, uh, the COVID nineteen transmission, and uh, and actually this one uh, uh, stops at uh, uh, in August of twenty twenty. And if we had uh, uh, extended this, uh, you would see as well that uh, um, we were among the uh, the last actually to to relax these restrictions. This non pharmaceutical uh, interventions uh, consisted of international border closures. Um, inter-regional mobility restrictions, closures of establishments, including schools, stay-at-home orders, etc. Now, part of the reason why we have this very stringent non-pharmaceutical interventions is because of the vulnerabilities of our healthcare system and also our, our health profile as a country. And now what we did here next was really to look at the uh, uh, what are these uh, vulnerabilities? And we use the, uh, the the SDG actually. We applied network analysis on the SDG just to find out uh, what are these critical uh, factors that we need to uh, we need to look out for. So uh, target three point three is about fighting communicable diseases and uh, COVID nineteen. Of course, is a very very is very high up there in the uh, in the spectrum. Uh, but what affects this? Uh, communicable diseases well we have the incidence of non-communicable diseases uh, which actually impairs our immune system we also have uh, substance abuse and then the smoking we also have um, living conditions uh, with respect to housing with respect to uh, transport systems even and then uh, the work environment and as mentioned earlier uh, that uh, this is actually you know uh, the poor and the rich have uh, very, very uh, disparate uh, living conditions in terms of uh, housing, even available transport options, and their work environment. And then there's also the uh, the factor of the environment, which, uh, as you know, uh, this communicable disease, COVID-19, as well as the others, are zoonotic diseases. And, uh, and uh, many scientists think that this is really because we have been encroaching on the habitat of, uh, of, of of animals, actually, and that is the reason why you have this transmission from uh, animals to to humans. On the other side of uh, of this uh, framework is really about uh, you know the, uh, the the level, the the quality, and of course the the extent of uh, the research uh, and development of uh, of. In, in terms of health, the health research and development in terms of vaccines, in terms even of, uh, of uh, therapeutics, and then, of course, the universal healthcare coverage uh, and the healthcare financing. And the ones that, uh, uh, the factors that affect this would be your uh, um, employment and, of course, uh, the economic performance of the country in general. So given this uh, framework, 
we uh, then looked at the uh, comparative stats uh, um, across uh, various uh, ASEAN countries, so versus Thailand, Vietnam, Malaysia, Indonesia, Singapore. This is not the uh, the complete uh, table, of course, uh, uh, in the interest of time. So as you can see here, in terms of uh, cardiovascular disease, our uh, in uh, our mortality rate. A number per 100,000, and this is in 2017, we are actually, we have the highest uh, mortality rate. And so a uh, very, very high incidence of uh, even the non-communicable disease. Uh, even diabetes uh, prevalent, prevalence, that's also quite high, except uh, versus Malaysia and, uh, and Singapore. Smoking is also uh, a problem amongst us. Uh, what is uh, actually uh, uh, going well for us is the fact that we have a young population. Uh, living conditions is also a big uh, problem, of course. As so uh, if you look at the uh, population density, of course, uh, versus um, you take away Singapore, then we have um, the highest population density. And of course, if you uh, again, this is very disparate across uh, across the country. So, especially among the the, the urban poor, uh, that population de density is uh, much much higher. Um, GDP per capita uh, is also um, we're only uh, well second from the bottom uh, bottom being being uh, Vietnam. But in terms of uh, hand washing facilities, uh, again second to the bottom bottom being uh, Indonesia. So there are lots of uh, vulnerabilities of uh, our healthcare system, our health profile as a country. I did not include here anymore the, uh, um, the you know, healthcare workers, human resources for health uh, per, uh, per 1,000 population, but we are still uh, among the, uh, the lowest here. Now, this is the public health expenditure per capita among neighboring countries. And again, uh, Philippines would be <laughs> down there, down below. Uh, so we have the lowest uh, PhD per capita among neighboring countries. And in fact, if, uh, if you look at the uh, out-of-pocket expenditures uh, for health uh, for, uh, per capita, and this is already you know, even corrected for, uh, uh, for uh, GDP uh, per capita, we actually spend uh, the highest in terms of uh, out-of-pocket spending. And of course, you could just imagine how this discourages people from, uh, from seeking health care and therefore that very high uh, mortality uh, in uh, non-communicable diseases because of this. Apart from this health risk, we also have many income risks being faced uh, by Filipinos. So we did this uh, survey, for instance, uh, back in 2016 where we found that majority of Filipinos cannot recover from big unexpected expenses. Uh, and then also during, uh, in 2020, um, we have also noted that it surfaced gaps in the country's social protection system, revealing the vulnerability of many Filipinos to uh, income shocks. So from the Dole data, we found that 2.2 million uh, workers have been displaced. Uh, in terms of the, uh, again, the consumer survey that we, we found that 40% actually experienced a, a decline in their, in their incomes. Uh, in terms of enterprises, 60% stopped operations and only 12% were able to, uh, to implement this uh, work from home arrangement and this alternative uh, work arrangements. Others are really, you know, it's, it's really your, your pen and paper, the brick and mortar. They do not have, uh, they have not really adopted to a, a digitally, digitalization of their business. And then uh, while our economy is uh, gradually recovering, many are still feeling the brunt of the, uh, the pandemic. And this is uh, actually in terms of, uh, you know, back in, in, in 2021. Now, there's another study that we did, and uh, we looked at uh, the coping mechanisms for income shocks. And this is actually based on uh, key informant interviews. We looked at uh, several uh, income shocks uh, being due to natural disasters, for instance, human-induced, uh, like uh, armed conflict, and then economic risks like unemployment and loss of livelihood, and then individual and life cycle risks. So if you look at uh, um, their, their access 
to government assistance, so let's say NG and LGU assistance, um, we note that uh, it's it's pretty pretty accessible in terms of natural disasters, human induced, and uh, a bit on you on hospitalization expenses. But in terms of economic risks, then uh, assistance uh, from LGU and NG from government actually is very very inaccessible. It's only one out of twelve here in terms of uh, you know this key informant interviews. Uh, savings is also quite ve quite very low. The same uh, uh, the same incidence as uh, access to uh, NG assistance. So uh, this is uh, where we we. Uh, where our social protection system actually is failing in terms of this uh, economic risk. So um, it's it's like we have actually, you know, we, we do have this uh, social protection mechanisms to deal with disasters, human induced, and even the, uh, the life cycle risks, but not so much on the economic risks. Uh, this is a table that uh, I, I would just like to show here that, uh, that could be responsible also for 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 some of these uh, economic risks, uh, like the unemployment rate, for instance, of the bottom forty percent versus the rest of the population, uh, and then in terms of the class of worker. So we see that uh, in the bottom forty uh, percent, uh, there are actually less uh, percentage of workers who are employed as uh, wage and salaried workers. Uh, especially if you consider those working for uh, private establishments and working for for government, and uh, that's also one of the reasons why you have uh, they are more vulnerable to economic risks. Lessons learned from the pandemic: first, that everything is interconnected, but the problem is that many of these connectivity <laughs> issues are very inefficient, talking about physical connectivity and then, of course, the uh, digital connectivity. And therefore, we need to invest in early warning systems, um, not just for, uh, for um, weather shocks, but for, for others, especially these uh, this health shocks. We need to invest in social protection systems. We need to also uh, again, have more of this resilience building programs, uh, savings mobilization being one of them, uh, insurance, of course, and is, uh, is another. We need to have R&D and innovation and, of course, technology so that we can be more agile uh, when it comes to, uh, to different risks so we can easily adapt. And then that there are limits to fiscal policy. Uh, and in fact, that governance is more important than government. It's really about uh, the, the more robust solution is to build the resilience of every Filipino individual and every Filipino family. Let me now uh, quickly discuss the eight-point agenda. The eight-point agenda focuses on both the near-term issues because what we want to see, what we want to see, is really uh, going back. Uh, accelerating actually socioeconomic recovery, and we are seeing that uh, there are this um, you know this uh, three uh, current uh, constraints to um, to having an accelerated economic recovery. One is inflation. The next is the scaring from the COVID nineteen pandemic, and the other one is uh, you know about uh, securing our macroeconomic fundamentals. So first. Uh, agenda is to protect the purchasing power of uh, of families, but again, in terms of prioritization, it's really about ensuring food security, especially of the most vulnerable. We next, it's about reducing vulnerability and mitigating the scaring from the COVID nineteen pandemic, addressing our health system, uh, the learning losses, and then of course modernizing social protection. Next is about ensuring macroeconomic fundamentals. Uh, we are seeing. Uh, one is uh, enhancing bureaucratic efficiency, of course, sound fiscal management, and an innovative financial sector. Now, there's also the medium-term uh, constraints that we need to uh, we need to be able to address so that we can have this economic transformation. And this is really about creating more jobs, creating quality jobs, and creating the green jobs. And then. Uh, as an enabling environment, uh, we need to ensure a level playing field and we need to uphold public order, safety, peace, and security. 
So taking off from that eight-point agenda, we already came up with a strategy framework for the next Philippine Development Plan. So the overall goal is to reinvigorate job creation and poverty reduction. And uh, it's really by steering the economy back on the high growth path, and more importantly, to effect economic transformation for a prosperous, inclusive, and resilient society. So this is, we think, uh, the, the robust uh, way to address um, our vulnerabilities. Let's have job creation, let's have quality jobs, and that is really through economic transformation. What remains the same? It's a whole of government. It will still be a whole of society uh, approach to formulating this PDP. What change? It will be outcome focused, but issue driven. We will be addressing issues, especially those uh, lessons that have surfaced during the COVID-19 experience. It will be forward looking, but relevant even to the present concerns. And we want the whole of government, every agency in government to adopt this value chain mindset, to realize that everything we do is actually interconnected and therefore we have to make sure that uh, we do, you know, we come up with, with the best solution given our concerns because we know that this will, this will uh, uh, cascade to the other sectors as well. We're talking about economic transformation of the economic sector, the institutions, the social sector, and then the environment. And this is now the framework of the next Philippine Development Plan. So as we mentioned, the overall goal is economic transformation for a prosperous, inclusive, and resilient society. Two major objectives here. One is to develop and protect capabilities of individuals and families. It's about resilience building. And we uh, uh, and uh, we figured it should be about developing first those capabilities, promoting human capital and social development, increasing the income earning ability, and then protecting the purchasing power of individuals and families. The next part of that is, uh, is to transform the production sectors such that they are able to generate more and quality jobs and able to produce competitive products that are, you know, are affordable and good quality. So we're talking about modernizing agriculture and agribusiness, revitalizing industry, reinvigorating services. This economic transformation will come by way of uh, promoting trade and investments, expanding the market uh, so that there will be uh, more jobs. Next, advancing research and development, technology development and adoption, and then innovation, and then enhancing inter-industry linkages. So with respect to agriculture, we want more of the agribusiness. With respect to, uh, to the industry, manufacturing, and then the services, we want more of the serviceification of industry. We also want to harness the uh, potential of creative industries to affect these linkages. And then, of course, we have the enabling environment of good governance, macro stability, competition, regulatory efficiency. Climate action is also here. Uh, uh, infrastructure development, uh, in particular, physical and digital connectivity, and then peace and order. So the, the task ahead is actually uh, uh, quite uh, uh, quite daunting, but uh, as we always say, it's not insurmountable. So we are looking at the uh, reforms that have been enacted during the previous administration, and we will take full advantage of this so that we are able to have this economic transformation. And in the end, what we want is prosperity for all. We want it inclusive and we want a resilient society so that by 2040, we all Filipinos will get to enjoy this matatag maginhawa at panatag na buhay. Thank you very much for your attention.